Hey guys, what's up? It's Big Jack Films here, and welcome back to 85 Years of Kong. And today we have a very special guest with us, probably one of the biggest guests we've had on our show so far. Um, this is going to play out as kind of a podcast, essentially, and uh, we're just going to have an interview with this really amazing person. Uh, please help me welcoming Mrs. Mary Gellerman, who is the uh, wife of one John Gellerman, who directed the 1976 King Kong, which is my personal favorite film of all time. So, figured I'd just uh, bring her on and uh, we'd have a chance to talk to her. How are you doing, Mary? I'm doing fine, thank you. Um, I don't know if all your vi viewers know I'm the widow of John Gilliman. Yes, of course. Who died in 2015. And I should say, I think, that I'm the second wife. Um, so that I would have the stories he told me but I wasn't there when he was directing. So I'm just letting the listeners know that that's, that's what I have to give no, no more. <laughs> All right. Um, but yeah, we have a couple of questions for you. Uh, I think the, the main thing we do want to discuss too is John himself um, as a director yeah. and also as a person. Cause I think one of the things that like a lot of the media pushes and everything with John is that he was kind of, he was very angry on set, but in reality, he was the sweetest guy, as as far as I'm concerned. And he created such amazing films, Towering Inferno, Kong 76, even King Kong Lives. I'm like, I like that movie. You know, I don't know if not many people like it, but I'm like, I love it. I think it's a decent sequel. Um, but yeah, how was John as a person? How was he as a, um, you know, as a director and everything from your perspective? Well... I can't really answer how he was as a director because of meeting him uh, eight or ten years after he retired. But as a person, he was pretty much what you described in those two sentences. He, he had a temper. It was especially bad when he was trying to write screenplays. Like, that's the post-retirement version of being on set and trying to get everything perfect, which I think was part of the reputation he has about shouting at the crew was that he was quite a perfectionist are you okay or is that echo interfering oh, it, it sounds it sounds perfectly fine sounds all right your end so um but some of it i think is a misunderstanding about his friendness uh i once heard a story i think it was at the memorial showing that i put on of uh, his masterpiece, Rapture, uh, locally here in Topanga. And someone told me about a friend of those who was a French director uh, in here in L.A. And everybody said to him, why are you shouting? And they'd say, you're so rude. And he'd go, what's going on? I'm, I don't think I'm shouting. I don't think I'm being rude. And... The French are very passionate, right? <laughs> and John was very passionate. Like, for example, right, he died at nearly 90, right up, nearly up until his death, if we were listening to a truly amazing saxophone or clarinet jazz solo, like the one that Woody Allen uses at the beginning of Midnight in Paris, he would be sitting in his chair playing an imaginary clarinet and every fiber of his being was playing this imaginary clarinet. Or if we were listening to the slow movements of Mozart, he'd be crying and he'd look at me and he'd say, are you crying? And it was like a test. I was supposed to be as sensitive as he was and luckily for me I was, right? So that's not very English behavior. People be thinking of him as English, American, because that's where he grew up. But his soul was very French and very passionate. And in keeping with that, the other side of him, like you said, a really sweet guy, that's what people, uh, some of the people say on the backstory uh, film about the making of Towering Inferno, on the Towering Inferno DVD, was, you know, he never shouted. Oh, when Alan was shouting all the time, but John never shouted. He was always a gentleman, he was always considerate. And he definitely had that uh, they're like a loud, passionate side and a gentle, passionate side, to speak my meaning. But what he wasn't was boring English. <laughs> like, I like to think I'm not boring English, but I haven't got the French blood. 
<laughs> Gra granted, too, um, I can like I given John did have a temper. I mean, as a director myself, I usually have the same issues when I'm writing scripts and everything. So, in that sense, I could totally relate to him and how you know just trying you're trying to perfect your shots, but so much stuff got in the way, and especially with Kong because Kong was just kind of you know it had to be shot and finished in less than a year. Because, you know, they were competing with Universal at the time to get the first shot in the can. But once they beat that, they had to make that release date. Um, and uh, something I did actually want to bring up is, um, did John ever tell any stories or anything about the making of the film? And uh, what went on during the production? Um, he shared his stories um, that he told me were mostly about Jessica Lang. I think he was really proud of her career and of him being the first person to give her a part. And um, as, you, as you probably know, but your listeners may not know, it was a very, very long search for the person who was going to play the Faye Ray part. And uh, John was in despair, and he got this phone call from a woman, I can't remember her name, but she ran a fam the famous modeling agency in New York where Jessica Lang was a model in whatever year this is, 73 or whatever. No, wrong year, but... 75, anyway. 75, and, I believe, yeah. Okay, 75. Yeah. And she said, I think, this, I think Jessica Lang might be the right part. So he said, okay. So he flew her over, wherever the over was. I don't know where she was. And um, she arrived with a head cold. So she was all flushed, she was snuffling, her face was swollen, but he felt there was something about it. So he said, I tell you what, I'm going to put you up in a hotel for a couple of days. Um, when you better, come back and we'll do a screen shoot. And again, I think at his memorial, somebody told me, he didn't tell me this bit, but when he saw the first rushes of the screen test, he was so excited that he kicked over the chair in front of him <laughs> because he went, yes, you know, this is it, this is it. I found her at last. And um, of course she hadn't acted. It was a very first film. And the other thing I remember him telling me, and this is something that really touches me, something I really love about my husband, and I am with some other people, uh, very slowly producing a book of essays uh, about his work. And um, what he had was an ability to really understand the beauty of femininity, both in its strong version, like with the um, people in China, the women in China, and the vulnerable version of femininity, the soft, yielding femininity that Jessica Lange so was in this her first film. Fantastic. And when she was... Sorry? She was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Right. So I love this little story, John. So she's about to go on the raft and be discovered. I don't know if they shot that very first thing. He made it sound as though it was the very first thing she ever did. And she, she said, well, you know, what do I do? And he said, just channel Marilyn Monroe. And to me, she has that yearning, sweet, uh, delicate femininity. That's only one side of femininity, but that's really appealing to me. And uh, she does that on that raft scene. When you know that's the acting direction she was given, you go... Oh, yeah, <laughs> she's doing that. She's bringing that kind of side of Marilyn Monroe into her performance in her own way. And I think it's really beautiful how she does that in many of the scenes. Uh, he, he did tell me a little bit about it going on so long and it was really hard to keep shooting it. And there was, you know, all the difficulty with the mechanical monster and the mechanical hand and... But he liked to tell me more about um, how he, he he found her and how he was so happy working with her. She seemed, and she is definitely an incredible actress. I know some of the other audition choices at the time, 
and it was mostly mixed because with the Universal production, uh, they were thinking uh, Barbara Streisand and even Meryl Streep at uh, some points were considered for the role. I think even Cher was considered at some point. But yeah, Lang definitely fit the bill on that part, and she nailed it completely. And I can totally see, yeah, like, n now thinking about that, going for Marilyn Monroe, that's totally what it is. And she does it brilliantly. When she was on the raft, uh, from what I heard, when she was on the raft and she was doing that scene where she's first introduced, there were actually sharks circling the raft when they were shooting that scene. Yeah, yeah they were, they were, they, they were, and she didn't know, they didn't tell her until, like, afterwards, that's funny. Yeah, and uh, so, yeah, the the production was incredible. The, did he ever talk about any of the locations, like Hawaii and shooting in New York and whatnot? Like, did he ever talk about how amazing the locations and sets were on the production? Yes, he did, a little bit. Yeah, he he really loved Hawaii, and um, he, he was very happy that they found such beautiful scenery, and I think I'm very happy with how he had it you know how he directed the scenery into the film you know and um he did talk to me about the what an amazing experience it was going to the very top of the world trade tower when it was there you know yeah it was in the film I think he went out a little bit onto the plank to put, put some kind of plank between the buildings, presumably to do with getting shots or something. And I, I think he told me he went out a little ways on it, but it was too scary or something like that. I can't quite remember. Mm -hmm. Did he ever talk it's about... Scary. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. John Sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say he was very fond of Jeff Bridges. Oh, Jeff Bridges. Uh, he really enjoyed working with him. Yeah, because he was like... He that was like he was already a huge actor at the time. Uh, from what I heard, he wa Jeff wanted the part. He actually loved the original as a kid, and he would actually fake sick to watch it on uh, television. So it was kind of natural that he would uh, be a part of it. So like, yeah, did I mean John really admired Jeff, and probably even Charles Grodin as well. Um, did, did you have anything to say about those guys? No, you know. When when I met him, he didn't have a single copy of any of his films. And because VHS and then DVD were coming more into circulation, I started collecting them. And when we watched them, he'd say, don't remember a single shot. Really? And then he'd say, not, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then he'd say, not bad. He never once remembered a shot. And so his stories, he remembered the stories he remembered. And they were usually about the people. Do you see what I mean? He didn't, I was a bit frustrated, to be honest, because I sometimes heard about funny directing, uh, sorry, not directing mistakes, but when something went wrong on the set and how he'd reacted and things. But he'd have, you know, like two, three, four stories with most of the films that he'd done. And then that would be what he had. I mean, he was 72 when I met him and 90 when he died, nearly 90 when he died. So that's not unusual, I think, that when people get to those kind of ages, they remember what they remember, right? <laughs> What's of interest to them. What he did say was uh, he did an interview for the person that, uh, who founded Twilight Time, Nick Redman, who brought out uh, Rapture on Blu-ray. And because he was so grateful about Rapture being re-released, because it had no audience at the time, being black and white, just as it was changing the colour, he agreed to be interviewed for the um, uh, British Academy of Film and Television archives of living directors. It was only about two years, three years before he died. And Nick asked him, what was your favourite thing about directing? And he said his favorite thing, that makes me want to cry, <laughs> his favorite thing was that you were like a kind of psychiatrist, that everybody, crew, cast, everybody, when, I don't know, some people probably kept it private, already had their own real psychiatrist, but that people would come to him with their problems and their concerns. And that he, it meant a lot to him to listen and whatever he did, be able to kind of smooth it out for the running of the film. And that's not what you'd expect, really. 
somebody who had all that talent and his favorite thing was something connected to people. But it makes sense to me because of Smith's story, if he remembers, not how he took a shot, but what happened with the people. Yeah, you bring up uh, the uh, fact that he never had a copy of a single film. I have several copies of the film myself, DVD, uh, Betamax even. Like, I bought Betamax tapes. Um, I'm trying to get, like, a Super 8 copy. I just bought a Laserdisc, so I'm probably just going to try to find it on Laserdisc. Um, and you, I bring this up because um, I know for a lot of fans, especially here in North America, the movie has yet to receive a Blu-ray release. It's gotten Blu-rays in Europe and Japan but it's never got oh, it's never gotten a Blu-ray uh, here in the states because I don't know if Paramount just refuses to budge putting out a better quality product. The only one they have now is on DVD and it's a bad, poorly transfer of the laser disc. But if you go to European countries and stuff, you can get like a 720p HD print, and I think even AMC uses it to run when they show it on television. Um, and my question is like, if you like, I don't know what kind of like essential power you have with the rights over the film, but would it be possible to get like some sort of new remaster of um, a HD remaster of the film for Blu-ray sometime down the road? And if so, I know a lot of people would love to see the extended TV cut restored because the only way you can unfortunately get it is through when it was taped on television or if you have find like a 16 millimeter print. Um, would that be possible at all to get a, a, a remaster of the film at some point? Well, not through me and not even if John was alive. Um, I think, I don't know if uh, Twilight Time have considered doing King Kong because they've done quite a few of John's films now, but it really depends on whether the particular company is prepared to... Um, you know, give them a license or however that works. Like there's one film of, of John's called House of Cards that was one of Orson Welles' last parts. Not, he wasn't the lead. It was one of um, George Peppard's films with John. He did about three, I think. And it's a really good little thriller. But I think it's Universal in that. And um, Twilight Time tried really hard to uh, bring that out, and they weren't allowing it. So what can come out in these special new formats is entirely dependent on whether the studios are prepared to co uh, cooperate with companies like Twilight Time, or in England there's one called Renowned Pictures that does the black and white films, uh, you know, whether they want to cooperate or not. Nobody has any influence other than the studios. They, they hold the rights as far as I understand it. I know in uh, Europe and everything, Kong 76 is mostly owned by Studio Canal, which have a huge grip on that uh, right. on that licensing. Paramount only really releases it through North America. Um, the rights are... The rights itself are a story unto itself. Um, but yeah. And uh, one thing I did want to ask is, um, John eventually did uh, direct uh, King Kong Lives, the sequel with uh, Linda Hamilton and Brian Kerwin. Um, I know that film, unfortunately, did not do so well at the box office, and it was critically bashed and everything, but I find it as as, as a kind of a standalone film on its own, it's a perfectly fine little adventure film, and it was the first one of the first King Kong movies I ever saw. I, was, I saw that before 76, actually, as a kid, and I wonder if John ever talked about that film in, in, in any particular way. Well, if you'll excuse my language, it's say piece of shit <laughs> it's cool like we 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 pg-13 well, that's usually our rating system here on the channel so uh you, okay. you, you didn't care much for it no he, I, I think i don't really quite remember the story about it but i think dino was all hot to do it as a sequel and thought it would be a blockbuster and john knew it wouldn't uh, he didn't really want to do it, but he always, uh, how, how can I put this? He always took work when it was offered to him. I mean, I don't mean he took every script that was offered to him, but I suppose he must have felt, you know, he worked with two really big producers, Daryl Zanuck and Dina De Laurentiis. For like, they were the two he talked about. I expect he worked with other big producers, um, but they were the two biggest ones he worked with, I think. And I think he must have felt that he had to go with 
Dino's pressure and I think regretted it. I don't think he really liked making that film, especially in the climate of North Carolina. <laughs> yeah, um, I know. I found out apparently um, they had some leftover pieces from the film that were left in North Carolina and that in that studio was just left to rot. And the animatronic hand used on King Kong Lives, it wasn't... People usually think they just refurbished the animatronic pieces from 76, but in reality, they re they just pretty much rebuilt them. And the hand used in Lives uh, ended up uh, being thrown in a like a like some sort of junk pile or whatever in the studio. The new management had said to basically destroy everything. But this guy uh, in North Carolina grabbed the hand... And he left it on, stuck it on his front lawn for close to three decades. And uh, it eventually got onto eBay. I tried to get a hold of him because I wanted to go see this thing up close. And unfortunately, it sold on eBay for like $7,000. And I can't find any tr trace of it. But uh, I'm a big fan of like keeping memorabilia and props from several films. Uh, but I know the original hand from 76 actually still exists in Italy. And it's in a storage uh, unit because back in the 80s, Carlo Rambaldi, the mechanical operator, uh, had taken a lot of his pieces in the early 90s to a museum in Italy. And he showcased the hand that was actually still working and everything. It's unclear when the place closed, but uh, the hand is still there. And I think the Rambaldi estate is trying to get it restored so they can place it somewhere in like some sort of film museum. Oh, interesting. Well, I just something just popped into my mind that you may know about, but we may not know about. Um, in uh, December, it was the 40th anniversary of um, John's King Kong. And in L.A., they did a special anniversary screening at, um, you know, an old style cinema called the Aero Theater. And they had a panel discussion afterwards, and they had, I think, Rimbaldi, but somebody connected with the mechanical thing and they had a couple of the actors and what I'm leading up to is the whole thing is on YouTube. Oh yeah, I'll put that a link whole... I'll, I'll put a link down below for people who want to see the panel. I think uh, Rick Baker who was in the Kong suit in 76 right, yeah. who incredibly talented guy um he was a major uh guy on the panel and everything and I I love Rick Baker. Right. I've been following his work um ever since and it's funny enough he ended up doing the another re giant gorilla remake where he did the remake for Mighty Joe Young for Disney in '98, and he act and I remember he stated that that was the suit he wanted to make for Kong, but because they wanted uh -huh. to go because they wanted the producer Dino De Laurentiis wanted to go for more of like a man a human gorilla kind of hybrid, and he was Rick was able to persuade them to say no we should make it a gorilla and I think John actually liked Rick's performance over like everything else and did he ever talk yeah. about Rick Baker at all? No, he didn't. When I, when I was there in the audience when that panel discussion took place, so I learned more about King Kong from that than I did from John. It must have been great to see it as well, like on the big screen with an audience, because that's something yeah, I've always wanted was. to do is uh, watch it with an audience and like especially hear the reactions, especially to the humor of the film, because I think the humor is still really funny. There's like parts I just, I'm, I see the film and I just imagine a laugh track with it at some points. Yeah, no, no, ab you're absolutely right. And the other thing that I, yes, people did laugh. And the other thing that I noticed was that you can imagine that on the large screen, the fact that they'd had to do everything with green screen and old fashioned techniques and no computer assistance showed a bit, but I'm a psychotherapist and that, what I am saying that is that I can kind of sense how people are reacting. And I was pretty surprised that the audience was as wrapped in attention as though they were watching the latest computer animated graphics. And the, the, um, the lack of sophistication in comparison with modern day computer graphics was obvious to everyone in the audience. But he gets that emotional life into it so strongly that everyone was spellbound, and there was and there was a big collapse, uh, not collapse, <laughs> applause, applause at the end. You know, it really was a very moving experience as his um, widow to be there. You know, he was only a year dead then when that anniversary happened, and it was a very moving experience to be with you know a couple of hundred people who were loving that film. 
Yeah, I know every time I watch it, I do get a little choked up on it. It's um, an incredible ending, and especially, like, when they have, like, the actual piece of Kong, the big star from Kong, as it was, because they couldn't use the big animatronic, so they basically created a styrofoam version of it, and they placed it in the pl World Trade Center Plaza. And there were times, like, the uh, the uh, crowds would come in, and I think there was a... They said, like, Kong got mugged, because I think one of his eyes was missing, and, like, one of the uh, glass eyes. Which, actually, I found out that glass eye that apparently was stolen on the set actually ended up on a props website, and it went up for auction. And, uh, so apparently somebody's bought in that glass eye. But... The, um, I wanted to bring up that Styrofoam Kong because it turns out they had, um, Carlo Rambaldi had sent it over to an amusement park in, uh, in Italy, another amusement park, and it was there till, like, the early 90s, and, again, it's hard, it's hard to keep track of any of this stuff, uh, like, especially all these pieces, because some of these should belong in museums, in my opinion, um, I'm a very big fan of, like, keeping track of a lot of props and pieces from some of right. my favorite films. There was something else I'd like to say about a comparison with the 2000 film. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, just speak your yeah. mind. Okay, so one of the things that really impresses me about John's King Kong that goes with what I was saying before about feeling he really he really loved feminine femininity. He just loved it so deeply. He loved that about his first wife, he loved that about me when we, we met, and the relationship between the giant ape and Jessica Lang in John's film is very tender and not sexualized, right? It's, there's a sens sensuousness there, there's a real human, if you like, connection there. It's very emotional and it's very sensitive. And when I saw the 2000 version, I, I was creeped out by it, if it's all right to say that in a public place, because it was too sexual, the, the sexualized, the, 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 the relationship between, I've forgotten her name off the top of my head. Naomi the Watts. Actress, Naomi Watts, is it? Yeah, yes. Naomi Watts? Yeah. Naomi Watts, the ape, was like uh, unpleasant to me. And um, leave that to one side. I, I, uh, John's ability to get inside the feeling of being a woman in different situations shows particularly in his many wonderful British black and white films that are not so well known over here. He was just amazing in that way. That's what I'm going to write about in the book I'm producing. <laughs> uh, he, he was a very, very unusual man. Yeah, and speaking of the book, I might as well just, you know, we might as well put the plug in there. Yeah, so you're working on a book about John's life, and uh, what can we expect from this uh, book coming out? Okay, so he died, right? And until he died, and the Wikipedia contributors had obituaries to put things from, the only thing that was on was the thing you first mentioned about him being bad-tempered and shouting, right? That was Wikipedia entry prior to his death was only about him shouting, was really um, biased and unfair. So when he died, there was there's not one book about his work, and he directed 40 films. That's like one a year for the number of years he was directing, plus in the 50s, about 25, 30 television episodes a year as well. In the, did I say 30s? 50s. And... Um, he had this enormous output, and there was nothing more than a few paragraphs, like in Ray Morton's book about King Kong. It's, it was just a few paragraphs here and there about John. So I thought, I'm going to change this. So I tried to interest the, I did interest the editor of a British series called British Filmmakers. There's about 20 books, not one about John. And the editor of that tried two different places to get a grant to be able to write a book himself about John. And he couldn't get the grant, he was retired, he needed the grant in the funding in order to do it. So I said, well, let's get some other contributors, let's produce the book ourselves. So 
I, what, uh, what we're doing very, very slowly, everyone's got busy lives, and I haven't edited a book before, etc. Um, but we've got about eight or nine contributors. So we'll have a section at the end that is three big blockbusters, a section in the middle that's two different takes on Rapture, because that he considered, and so do other people consider it to be his masterpiece, and then a first section that's about his history with a studio called Adelphi Studios that really gave him a start and uh, different takes on his black and white films. Then in the meantime, when the first person, Neil Sinyard, who edit, edited the, um, uh, the, this other series, British Filmmakers, and who's writing about uh, Waltz of the Toreadors and um, Never Let Go for the film, for anyone who knows British films, um, he suggested this Australian film critic who also writes about British black and white films called Jeff Mayer. And Jeff Mayer is going to do, a, um, it's not going to come out for a couple of years because it's not starting to, I think, till 2019. But Jeff Mayer is, uh, in collaboration with somebody else, is going to do everything he ever produced from A to Z of John's films. So come 2020, 2021, there will be two different books available that are very, very different, you know, like uh, concentrated looks on certain aspects of his work and then one of those big sweeping ones that is encyclopedic. I'll be definitely be sure to pick that up when it comes out and I'll read through it because John's work is incredibly uh, impressive to me. It's like... When I saw his Kong, I just, as a kid, it's he's, Kong scared the crap out of me. But now it's just like, the more I, the more I watch it, the more I fall in love with it. I've I've watched it countless times. I I'd, I'd watch it on like yeah. my work shifts when to pass the time. I'd listen to it as a radio drama, and then like the only time I really watch it now is if it's on television because like I've seen it so many times. But um, anyway, I, I we we really appreciate you coming on to uh, our channel and talking to us about my personal favorite film of all time. Uh, it really means a lot oh, to us. Awesome. Yeah, it really means a lot to us. And I'm, it's you know, you probably think this kid is like probably in his early twenties and like he likes a movie that's forty years old. It's like a, a movie that's not really well known. It's like no, I I'm a seventy cinema is some of the best filmmaking in 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 in, in history. Uh, that's three year strike of just big hits with Jaws, uh, the Kong, yeah. and then Star Wars followed right after. So those three are my personal favorite films of all time, and they came in the span of a year each. So wow. we can't thank you enough for uh, sharing your stories about John. And if you ever want to like come on by again, just uh, give us a call, and we'll uh, be glad to have you on. That's great. I've had great fun. Thank you very much, Jack. No problem. And in the meantime, guys, uh, you know, share your opinions, thoughts in the comments. Uh, and we're going to 85 years of Kong is going to continue throughout March. So we'll see you guys later. Until the next video, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. This is Big Jack Films signing off. Take care.